All right, so lesson 65, uh, Jonah chapter 1, God calling Jonah. So our uh, lessons on Jonah here are split in two. One lesson today, the next lesson will be um, the second part of Jonah. So Jonah uh, chapter 1, uh, again this falls in historically in the context right now. That's why it's put here. Uh, it's during the time of Israel. Um, when they're living in sin and wickedness, but yet have not been taken away into captivity. Um, so this kind of fits here as we go through the history of uh, Israel. Okay? Um, but in your Bibles, notice it's not by First and Second Kings or First and Second Chronicles, which has happened chronologically. It's in the prophets. Okay? Because Jonah was a prophet. And his prophecy was not just for the people of Nineveh, but it was also for us. So that's why it's placed here, um, we could say, God's divine wisdom and ordering men. They put Jonah here with a prophetic, uh, not necessarily in order there. Alright, so Jonah chapter 1, let's get a little bit of a background about uh, Jonah and, and what he's supposed to do. Chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it, to go with him unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So we don't know here, it just says the word of the Lord came to Jonah. The Bible doesn't tell us how that word came. Was it in a vision? Was it a dream? Did the Lord speak to him? Um, but it was a, a message, and this is what it said Go to Nineveh, cry against it, which means tell the people about their sins. Okay? Uh, and the reason is. Their, their wickedness is great. It's come up before me, he says. So they are very, very wicked people. Okay? Now, we need to know a little bit about Jonah. Where was he working? Well, he was working in Israel. He was a prophet in Israel. So he would have been preaching and the teaching uh, the people there. And now, all of a sudden, he's called to go somewhere else. And he might have thought to himself, well, hold on. My work here in Israel isn't finished. The people still need me here. There's much ungodliness here in Israel. Or maybe Jonah thinks to himself, ah, I don't want to travel. I'm not a traveling man. I just, I, I'm comfortable here in my own home in Israel. Okay? So uh, we know some of those things. Now what about Nineveh? What do we know about Nineveh? Well, Nineveh was a world power, the capital city of Assyria. Okay? Most of the world at this time was ruled by Assyria. Okay. You have the Assyrian nation, which will at some point be taken over by the Babylonian nation. So the Assyrians conquered and controlled much of the known world at that time. Okay. And we know something else about Nineveh. Uh, if I turn in my Bible here, you guys don't have to, but Genesis chapter 10. We read of Nineveh. There, in Genesis chapter 10, uh, verse 11. And there it says that in the beginning of his kingdom uh, was Babel. So now we're going back to that time. And we're speaking about Nimrod. And out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh. Okay? So Nimrod, the mighty hunter, that great man, would have started the city. And Nineveh continued until this day to be that great city. It was such a great city. Maybe some of you remember from your Bible stories before. It was three days journey. Okay? Three days to walk all the way around the city. So if a man in a day can walk 20 miles on average, giving him time to rest, giving him time to eat, sleep, 60 miles all the way around that city. Huge, huge metropolitan city. But it was also a city, as many cities are, of great wickedness. Many large cities 
Although they're enjoyable to visit, sometimes we ought to be careful because of their temptations that they have there. Great, large cities. Okay? So here was God telling Jonah to leave your land of comfort, Israel. Leave your work of prophesying to the people of Israel. Instead, Jonah, you need to go up to this even wickeder city, the great city of Nineveh, and there you have to preach. And you're not even going to be preaching to Israel. You're going to be preaching to the enemy of Israel, Assyria. Well, Jonah doesn't want to go. Okay. Why doesn't he want to go? Well, first of all, he doesn't want to help the enemy out. He doesn't want to see Nineveh be saved. They're the enemies of Israel in his mind. Okay. He maybe thought he was wiser than God. I know what would be better. So what does Jonah do? He disobeys God. He doesn't go to Nineveh. Instead, he decides, hmm, I shall go to Tarsus. And maybe that name rings a bell because, oh yeah, Saul or Paul of Tarsus. But anyways, he's going to say, I'm going to go to Tarsus. So he goes to a seaport, Joppa, and that will get him onto a boat that will take him to Tarsus. So he gets onto the boat, goes down below deck, and at some point during the journey, while below deck, he falls asleep. We don't know if this is a long, many-day journey, short day, but he's down in the boat in the hull, and there he falls asleep. He wants to quit. He wants to resign. It's not possible to do that. One can't quit or resign. Okay? Because what would God do to someone? He would give that person no peace. He would make them so miserable that there was no doubt in their mind that they couldn't do that. And here, God is going to use something else. And we'll see what that is. But anyways... Jonah wanted, he would rather do this, he'd rather flee from the Lord and go somewhere else than to preach to Nineveh. Now he knew he maybe, you might say, well why didn't he just stay in Israel then? Well, in Jonah's mind, that's where the Lord was working. And so he couldn't stay there. He had to get away. He had to find somewhere else. He thought he could hide from God. Often don't we think we can hide our sins from God. But God knows it all. He knows everything that we do. So, God leads him by a different way to get to Nineveh. And he's going to teach him, maybe not in a way that gave him no peace in his gut or his stomach, but gives him no peace in a different way. Verse 4, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. Okay. So soon after the boat leaves the harbor, how soon, we don't know. It's not important. But after it leaves in the harbor and gets out onto the sea, a mighty wind comes up and begins to create such great waves that the boat begins to be tossed to and fro as though it were maybe a mere toy, like in the bathtub. You can make the waves so big in the bathtub that it will very quickly overcome the ship. And the mariners on the ship begin to realize this is no small storm. This is a special storm. And they begin casting all of the stuff on the ship, for they were probably transporting some, some goods from Joppa to Tarsus or somewhere else along the route. And they begin to pitch it all overboard so that the boat becomes lightened, so that as the water comes on, the boat won't sink, but it will take on water, enough water that they can get rid of. And they begin to throw everything overboard. But what else do they do? They know that this is no regular storm. This is not like any other storm they've experienced. They know this is a storm of wrath, of anger. And so they begin to call upon each of them their gods. Maybe, maybe one man was from the land of the Philistines and begins to call on Baal. Okay? Maybe another man calls on Ashtoreth. Maybe another one was, on, was from Egypt and calls upon the, the god Ra. Who knows what they were all, but they were all praying to their own gods and it wasn't working. And so the shipmaster goes down into the bottom of the ship and there he finds Jonah fast asleep. Asleep in this type of storm that only the Lord could cause probably to come upon him. How is it possible that he could even sleep? Well, 
There's some pictures here. Obviously the boat is, is a picture of being in the world. Being tossed to and fro by those waves that our lives might be. Okay? And while he slept, he was kind of, in a sense, saying, I really don't care what happens to Nineveh, that great city. I just don't want to go prophesy against it. But anyways, God sends a shipmaster to come down there and tell him, what is the matter with you? Get up on board and call out upon your God. Maybe it's your God that is angry with us. Maybe it's your God that sent the storm and he will listen. Well, Jonah was no fool. He knew exactly what was going on. Verse 7 there, let's pick it up there. And they said everyone to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, what, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. So they cast lots. The lot falls to Jonah, obviously directed by the Lord. They speak to him, Why is this happening? And he tells them, he tells them who he is, a prophet from Israel. He tells them that the Lord sent him to Nineveh, but he ignored the Lord and now is trying to escape him. And so he confesses, this is the one only God, my God, who has sent us, because he is the one who creates heavens and earth. So how do they fix the problem? What do they do? Verse 11, Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless the men rode hard to bring it to the land. But they could not. For the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee. Let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. And the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah here tells the men, Men, there's only one way that this sea is going to stop being so tempestuous and to save your lives. In order for you to be saved so that the boat is not overcome with seawater and you all drown with me, cast me overboard into the raging sea and then the Lord will be satisfied. Jonah here is a picture of Christ. Offer me for these people and then the Lord's anger will be satisfied. Okay? But of course the men don't want to do it. They first, they, they say, no, 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 man, we can't do that. That will maybe make your God even more angry because we kill you. So they try and try. They try to roll their way to shore, but they couldn't. And finally they come to the conclusion, maybe some of them even with tears in their eyes, oh, man, we must do this. But then they begin to, sh to speak to the Lord. Lord, please don't hold this against us. We, we feel as though we are shedding innocent blood by doing this. Please don't hold this sin against us. And then with that, they pitch Jonah overboard. And immediately, when Jonah hits the waves, the sea becomes calm. And the men know the Lord is the one who controls all things. Whether they were saved or not, we don't know. But it sure seems like it from verse 16 because it says, They feared the Lord exceedingly. They offered sacrifices unto the Lord and they made vows. We can only think that these men were saved, that God used this example to save them. But maybe not either. That's not the important part here. The important part is that we see what the Lord does. Jonah is thrown into the sea, and when he's done that, he is sacrificed on the behalf of the other men, and the Lord removes his anger and wrath, just as he does with us. His, his anger, the justice that he wants, is satisfied by the death of his son Jesus Christ on the cross. And here, God's anger is satisfied too when Jonah is thrown overboard. And we can imagine... How soon after that, when Jonah was thrown into the waters, did he try to swim? Did he begin to sink immediately? How soon did the fish come? 
But all we know is the Lord miraculously prepared a great fish to come and swallow up Jonah so that he would be in the whale for three days and three nights. Another example of Christ here. So Christ, just as he descended into hell, so Jonah descends into the belly of this great fish. So Jonah was used to appease the anger of the Lord. So Christ appeases the anger of the Lord on our behalf because of our sins. And we know that after those three days, Jonah will be spit out. And after three days, Christ too came forth from the grave. So Jonah is a picture here, a prophetic picture for us of Jesus too. Not just the saints in the Old Testament, but for us too.